Okay, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read it. You might like to follow along. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and, through, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Though for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let me say at the start, it's not Christmas. Seems to be the only time that we read this passage at Christmas. It's an Adventy passage. Uh, but did you know you're allowed to read this at any time of the year? Permission given to read, permission given to think about it. And we're thinking about the Word of God this morning. And indeed, we are in a little series at the moment, thinking about the Word of God. And last week, uh, we looked together at how the Word gives guidance. The psalmist said he loves to meditate on the word of God and he would have thought just about the first five books of the Bible at that point in time. Uh, but how the word, the, 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 the word given by God is like a lamp and a light, just helping us in life to understand where we're going and what we should be doing. And today we're going to think about Jesus. What a great thing to think about. What a great person to think about. Jesus. Uh, the living word of God. So shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for your word, the written word that we have before us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, the living word. Thank you that your written word, these words that we have before us, point us to Jesus, the living word. And as we think about you this morning, as the living word, would you reveal yourself afresh to us that we may know and love you more. Amen. Well, I, um, I love reading. Does anyone else love reading? Yeah. I think it's a slightly old pastime nowadays. I think it's been surpassed by viewing image upon image upon image. Uh, but I love reading. I love words. I love learning. Uh, but I love words more than just the words on a bit of paper. I love listening to words. I love hearing uh, people's podcasts and hearing stories on the radio. Uh, I love watching films where the use of words helps us to see something. And I, I rather think that we take words for granted sometimes. Because they are so powerful. Words connect us to something much bigger than ourselves. Words open up a world before us. Uh, I don't know about your relationship with words. I don't know whether you have uh, in love words. You are uh, one who just loves learning new words. You love using new words. Or maybe you have always struggled with words. Maybe the thought of trying to articulate something, to say something, uh, it's just frankly intimidating. Uh, I was a bit like that 12 years ago. If you said to me, you will be standing up before people using words to explain stuff, uh, I would have laughed at you. 
I felt so intimidated by the idea of stringing a sentence together. And uh, amazing how God has sort of changed that a little bit. And I actually love the challenge of trying to help us understand what God is all about through the use of words. So don't give up. If that is you, if you're intimidated by words, don't give up. Keep going. Words are powerful. And without them, I'm not sure we would exist. One of my favorite films, I don't know what your favorite film is. One of my favorite films is a film called Shadowlands. Have you heard of Shadowlands? Shadowlands tells the story of a young C.S. Lewis who wrote the Narnia Chronicles as well as others. And it had that guy in Anthony Hopkins. Uh, He was playing C.S. Lewis, but he uh, also played the, the very scary one about someone doing something with lambs or something like that. So it was weird to see Anthony Hopkins in a sort of very soft and gentle depiction of C.S. Lewis. But anyway, there he was, and he's the young professor in Oxford who has influence uh, over these very bright young minds who have come to learn from his genius uh, in the almost ethereal atmosphere of, of the Oxford colleges. And there's this one scene in a pub where, um, where Clive is sat there next to this uh, young chap that he's been teaching. And this young chap has just been booted out of his college because he's been stealing books. He doesn't come from wealthy, from wealthy family, he says. Apologies to both of you. <laughs> got, got no money for books probably rather drink stout or something, I would think. But um, So he's been stealing the books. And Lewis says to him, you know, what, why have you done that? You could have gone to the library. What is it about these books? What is it? And uh, he says this one simple line that's always stuck with me. I read to know I'm not alone. I read to know I'm not alone. Words connect us to something greater than ourselves. Words do something that help us be connected. Uh, Our passage today from John chapter 1, our Advent passage that we're reading out of season, speaks about Jesus, although it doesn't explicitly call him Jesus, as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, always a bit of a clue, it's talking about uh, God there. In the beginning was the Word, And the word was with God, and the word was God. Later on, the word, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And no one's ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus, the living word, the word in the beginning The word with God, the word was God, the word came and lived amongst us. This word connects us to God, who is far greater than us. Words, I think, are able to take something conceptual, something that's going on in our hearts or our minds, and and, and breathe them into existence. I see, I could be thinking about something right now and I could be feeling something right now, but unless I said what I was thinking or feeling, uh, you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't know what I was thinking or feeling. So words take an idea and, and give it some shape and give it some form. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And then the word came and showed us what God looked like. Uh, Someone once said that the first chapter of the fourth gospel, that's the bit that we've just read, is one of the greatest adventures of religious thought ever achieved by the mind of man. It's incredible. It makes no sense until you really take time to read it and to think about it in context. Uh, John's gospel that we've been reading was written uh, to both uh, 
Jewish audience and a Greek audience. And John, who wrote it, was in Greece at the time. And, um, and he was trying to come up with a way to help both Christians and Jewish people to understand, uh, Greek and, and Jewish Christians, to understand how significant Jesus was. You see, if you were to say to a, a Greek person all about Jewish tradition and ideas, it, it would be lost on them. They would have no idea. So John is trying to find a way to talk about Jesus uh, in a relevant way to his audience. And uh, I think that's the challenge of the church, by the way, is to take these words of God, which are always relevant, which are always unchanging, and to present them in a relevant way to our audience, in a way that has meaning to people uh, around us. And so John latches on to this one word, which is word. You see, word in Jewish language and word in Greek language is the same. It's logos. Um, I don't speak any other languages particularly well, uh, but I understand that there are some words that are the same in say English as, it, as they are in French, say adore for instance. We, we share the word, we share uh, its root, we share its meaning. So when I say adore and a French person says adore, maybe in a slightly better way, a more beautiful way than we do, uh, we know what we're talking about. There's a point of commonality. And this is what John is doing with the word word or logos as it is in the original. He's found a word that makes sense to both audiences. Both of them get it straight, straight away. So what's it mean? Well, in, uh, in Jewish thought and Jewish understanding, logos or the word word uh, is more than just a sound or a grunt. Uh, the development of the, of the Hebrew uh, Jewish understanding is one of the ancient, most ancient civilizations going. And before that, frankly, words didn't really carry much more than <clears throat> which means there's some food over there, or, you know, or <clears throat> that's a beautiful woman. <laughs> and then the Hebrew culture comes along, and they, as well as other cultures around, uh, around the world, start forming words that actually mean something. The words meant something. They carried meaning. They conveyed something. They expressed something. But they, could, they conveyed and expressed something very, very significant and something very uh, particular. In the Greek language, there's about 200,000 words. In the Jewish language, this, and I'm talking biblical at the time, I'm sure we've added to it, there were only 10,000 words. So every word meant something, and it needed to be used very, very uh, sparingly. And not only that, but each word carried power. That is to say that when the word was spoken from the lips, it was able to do something. It was able to release something. It was able to bring something into being. And we think about how God at creation spoke the words and spoke the world into existence, the world into being. God's words was able to make something happen. And so throughout the Bible, you'll see things about blessings and about cursing. Have you read things like that? Where people were able to say something and they would actually release something in the atmosphere. They would release something. And you might think this is just ancient nonsense, but... Uh, think today about the words that have been spoken over you in your life and how they've just latched on to some, they've, they've latched on to you and you've carried them through, maybe something that was spoken over you as a child, uh, that could have been a positive thing or that could have been a negative thing and it could have shaped who you are today. Maybe if um, a, a parent saying to a child, you're useless, you're rubbish, Maybe that does something to a person. See, words carry power. Our words have power. And so that's a challenge for us, I think, as we speak words over people. What are the words we're going to speak over each other? Because if they have 
destructive powers. They also have very constructive powers. So if I was to say to you, look at you beautiful people, did you know that you are full of potential? Did you know that when you leave this place today, the next person you talk to, you could have the most significant impact on their life? Just by being you, just by being true to who you are in God, you are a woman of purpose. You're a woman of peace. And when you go home to your chaotic family, just by measure of being a woman of peace, you will change the atmosphere of your home. I mean, that, that, that is powerful stuff. Words carry something powerful. There's something powerful about them. Uh, also in Jewish understanding, the word word or logos it actually, when, it, when it's referred to the word of God, it was the same as saying the name of God. Word of God and name of God were, were the same thing. So when we read about the word of God throughout our scriptures, uh, we're actually referring to God himself, who he is. Uh, in Jewish understanding, um, it's not the dumb thing to write the full name of God because the name is so powerful in itself. It's far too righteous, far too holy. We can't possibly uh, uh, write it in its completion. So Jewish literature would find other ways of talking about God, uh, other ways of naming God. And, and one of the ways was talk, to talk about uh, the name of God as the word of God. So scripture writes the name of God. We know it's talking about God. Make no mistake. It's talking about God, God doing something. Also, the word of God in Jewish understanding refers to the reason of God, as in our minds. The reason of God. It, it explains something of the why. So let's take creation again. For example, when God spoke to creation, when the word of God spoke, or uh, in, in Job where, uh, and, jo and Jonah, where the word of God came to Jonah. That was the mind of God being spoken into that situation. The impartation of what God is thinking, his wisdom, his reason, his purpose being enacted. Creation was not a mistake, Christians believe, uh, but it, it was God's... God's purpose, God's reason, God's wisdom enacted creation into, into being. And I think we see this through Jesus, these, these things. I think we see Jesus' words carrying a lot of meaning. I think we see Jesus' words full of power. He spoke and people were healed. He spoke and Lazarus started walking out of the tomb. When he spoke, stuff happened. But when he spoke, he was invoking the name of God. And when he spoke, he was expressing the mind of God. Jesus had compassion on them and they were healed. So his words were an, an action of his compassion, the compassion of of God. Words today, I think, are, are used far too readily. I don't know if you'll agree with me. Uh, it's far too easy for our world leaders to uh, write a message that has 140 characters. Just think it, type it in, send it off, and it can have significant consequences, not only to people's lives, but to nations, the shapes of nations. I think... I, I love social media. I love the way that technology has enabled us to be connected to one another in, in the way that it has. But we need, to, we need to apply a little bit more caution to the words we are using on those platforms. The Church of England has recently been in the media because it has encouraged its leaders uh, and those who are coming along to its churches to think about how they're using social media. Praise God it has done that.
Uh, it also staggers me, and uh, I'm going to move off from the rant in a minute. It staggers me that for all the wonderful words we have in our Western vocabulary, we somehow are limited to using pathetic words sometimes. Let me give you an example. Uh, at the moment, Heidi is using a lot of words, and some of them are really bad. <laughs> she's wasting time, she's wasting breath using these silly words that she's picked up on the playground. Uh, my son, let me give you another example. Uh, my son will fall over and cry. And I'll say to him, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he'll just cry and he'll cry and he'll cry and he'll cry. And I'll say, I can't understand you unless you tell me what's going on. And he can't, he can't quite find the words, bless him, to say what he's feeling. So we're in this point of, uh, maybe it's just our family, <laughs> who knows. But we're at this point where sometimes we're not using enough words to explain things. And at other times, we're using the wrong words, silly words. Words are powerful. They're expressive. They carry meaning. Jesus is the living word. He never wasted a breath with the words that he used. Jesus was uh, the fulfillment of this book, of these beautiful words. See, Moses, it says in verse 17, had the law given to him. You remember he was given the law twice because the first time uh, some tablets were broken, then he went back up, he received it again. And, um, and so the, the Jewish heritage uh, had the first five books of the Bible and then the prophets and some Psalms. And it, it wasn't until a little bit later that, that we, the church, received this whole completed canon of, of scripture. And Jesus came as the completion, the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. And so the part that we've received is the story of Jesus, the story of the way that he has fulfilled everything in his being. Every word points to Jesus. Every word points to the love of God revealed in Jesus. Jesus is the word. He's the living word. Uh, so we heard about the Jewish context. Uh, how about the, the Greek understanding of the word word or the word Greek? Well, in Jewish understanding, the word word or the word logos was uh, something that brought order into being. Um, it, it was something that dictated a pattern. It, it was um, a design to seemingly bring peace to something that was confusing, i.e., I see something over there, I don't quite understand it, so I'm going to start to use logos, I'm start to use words to help me understand it a little bit more. Do you see? It, it brings in my mind an order to something that I see, a pattern to something that I see. And so when John spoke about uh, the logos, the word, he was talking about the mind of God to the Greeks and, to the, and the mind, the reason of God to the, to the Jewish audience. Controlling the world, holding the world together, bringing peace to the world. This is Jesus. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings purpose, who brings reason, who brings order. What keeps the stars in their course? What, what causes the tides to ebb and flow? Well, in Jewish understanding, it would be the logos, the word. It would be Jesus, reason, wisdom. The mind of God in action. John says in this passage that the word became flesh. Or put another way, the mind of God became a person. God became flesh, the word of God. The concept of God, 
was given something that people could hear and see and understand in Jesus Christ. Amazing. He is the mind, the wisdom, the reason, the meaning, the, the power of God. Jesus is the fullest understanding that we could possibly have of the Logos, the Word, of who God is. If you want to see the Father, see the Son. If you want to find God, find Jesus. Maybe this morning you're just kind of struggling to understand God. The concept of God, what on earth does that mean? Find Jesus and find an answer. Because in Jesus you'll find the words that you're looking for. Uh, Maybe it'd be helpful for us to think about Jesus the living word as a bridge, an image of a bridge. You remember that I was talking about uh, how words take a concept and, and give them some form. I think maybe that's kind of like a bridge that connects two things together. Uh, connecting God to humanity is done through Jesus, the Word. Jesus, the one who helps us to make sense of the gap in between. Because if we're here and God's here and there's a void in between, what can we do? We need Jesus, the Word, to help us make sense of God. The word is the way in which we are brought together with the Father. Uh, I want to invite us to stand now. And would you please stand? That would be wonderful. Very simply put, Jesus is the revelation of God. Jesus is the one who helps us to see God for who he is. Jesus is the one who helps us to know the Father's love, to know the Father's compassion, to know the Father's peace. The word of God brings order to things. And so I want us to just close our eyes for a moment. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us have a fresh revelation of who God is through the revelation of Jesus, the Word of God. So Spirit, would you come this morning, fall upon us afresh. Lord, your Word, your written Word can be sometimes confusing. Your written Word can sometimes just feel so out of touch with the reality of our lives. Would you come by your Holy Spirit this morning and as we've read these written words, would you point us to Jesus, the one in whom everything about you makes sense and about this world makes sense. Jesus, I thank you that you are the one who who adds form and adds shape and adds an image to the ways and the things and the person of God. Thank you that you are God. In you you can find answers reason, purpose, wisdom. In you there is hope. Jesus, it's all about you. The one who shows us what the Father is like. So would you come this morning, fall afresh upon us by your Spirit. Reveal to us your love. Show us Jesus once again. And the enormity and the reality of what Jesus accomplished through his life, his death and his resurrection. Come Spirit of God, ignite us, inspire us. May we be people of your word, not just your written word, but people of Jesus. Impart to us the mind of Christ, we pray. Help us to navigate through difficult decisions. Come, Spirit of God, stir us, excite us to read your word. Show us, Jesus, we pray, Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Amen.